Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today, we're going to continue our scholarly examination of Alien Worlds. We're up to number four here. This is, of course, Bruce Jones' written and edited science fiction title that ran in the early to mid-80s from Pacific Comics. Um, he had a lot of great uh, artists at his disposal. He... Uh, I guess he was a good networker. He knew all these great artists and guys who hadn't even drawn comics in years. He'd get them in Alien Worlds. So there's always nice art, but I gotta say, this is a very silly issue. This <laughs> Bruce Jones, I've said it before, one of the best writers in the 70s, 80s, you know, before there were good writers in comics, you know, before Alan Moore and Neil Gaiman. Um, most writers weren't that good. Um, they were, uh, at, at best, they were like kind of good sophomore college creative writing guys. At worst, they were just hacks. And Bruce Jones was amazing. He brought a lot of literary shit to his uh, scripts. But also, he loved DC Comics so much. I know I've talked about this before, but this one really shows off. He just always wants to have that twist ending, and no matter how ludicrous it is. So there's some ish comics in here that I was reading this last night, and I was just like, oh, Bruce Jones, come on. You're such a good writer when you want to be. What the hell's going on here? I'm sorry. I forgot to mention another beautiful Dave Stevens cover. Um, just, uh, I mean, what can you say? Dave Stevens. Just gorgeous art. Every cover he did. He did a lot of covers in the 80s. Thankfully. So we have this first uh, story called Princess Pam. And it's Bruce Jones' Scripting and penciling. So once again, we get a Bruce Jones pencil job. And I think he did this one for Alien Worlds. And the one last issue I think I told you about, or maybe that was two issues ago. I think, I think it was an old comic that he just, you know, dusted off. But it's got inks by Dave Stevens. So I think because he knew Dave Stevens was inking this, this is just a total piece of cheesecake, this comic. It's very slight, this story. And we basically see this kind of bubble-headed blonde uh, space cadet. And she's crash landed on a planet. Her little robot is um, kind of uh, apologizing. It's like, oh, it's my fault. I let you take the controls. I, I shouldn't have done that. And she's like, no, it's my fault. What was I thinking? I'm such a dummy. I shouldn't have taken the controls. Fouling things up as usual. That's what I do. So, um, she's on this planet and she's pretty hungry. I mean, look at this blatant cheesecake here. This is such a weird comic. So many stories in Alien Worlds are very serious. And this one is just so, just like, I'm going to make a softcore comic. So, he, uh, she's about to eat a mushroom. But he says, no, wait, I have to analyze that. Make sure it's not poisonous. And he tells her, he says, no, oh, it's good. You can eat it. So she eats all these mushrooms. And, uh, yeah, the robot's name is Sinks. And she wishes she landed on a better planet. This planet's very rocky. And, uh, it's not very pretty. And she says, oh, I wish I could be, like, a, on a beautiful little planet. Be like a princess with no responsibilities. But then she comes over this mountain pass and she finds a beautiful forest and streams. Of course, finding a little stream, it gives her a chance to do more cheesecake. She has to bathe and clean herself. And uh, I'm sorry, let's go back a little. She's telling Sinks about the Snow White myth. Because she's really onto this whole princess thing. She's like, yeah, there was a glass coffin because the dwarves loved her so much. They couldn't bear to, bear to bury her. And the handsome prince came and kissed her awake. And then she's like, I'm sleepy. I can't seem to focus. I'm dizzy. And she's like, what's happening to me? And she realizes, she says, the mushrooms, they were poisonous, weren't they? Why did you let me eat them? You didn't get through to the, on the radio. No one's coming to rescue us, are they? So she's not as uh, ditzy as she seems. 
So as she's like basically dying, Sings runs back to the spaceship and, uh, you know, it's all smashed, but it's it's got steel and glass and stuff. And he builds this glass coffin for her. Sing shut off his sensors, closed down his scanners and settled himself beside her. And Sinks thought of diamond mines and sparkling brooks and handsome princes. And Sinks prayed. <laughs> it's so dumb. I'm sorry. Just, I, I don't know why Sinks went crazy and wanted to turn into Snow White. And just that last line. And Sinks prayed. Robots don't pray. I mean, maybe because I'm such an atheist that annoys me, that line. But this is a really dumb story. <laughs> it's got beautiful art, though. It's really nice to look at. But uh, very silly. So the next story is called Girl of My Schemes. And script by Bruce Jones, art by Bo Hampton. He was just coming up around now. And he's already so good. I can't believe this kid. He's fucking young. He's very young. But look how good he is. He's just, like, really skilled. Great cartooning. So basically, it's just like in the future, there's this uh, corporation called Daydream Dream Incorporated. You come to them. It's almost like Total Recall, the movie. You have a fantasy, and they get robots to act it out, and they send you to a planet where you can live out your greatest fantasy. I imagine you have to be very rich. So this guy comes to them, and we see these very prim and proper administrators at this job. Uh, I'll find their names because their names are perfect. They they totally suit their characters. And this guy's obviously just some rich, spoiled guy. His fantasy basically involves he has lots of sex with this hot robot woman. I mean, it's kind of like a Flash Gordon fantasy, like, oh, I rescue her from a monster on this planet. But basically it's like, oh yeah, and then we have sex again. And you could tell these two are just like, uh, what a boorish you know, turd. So she's a Miss Peabody and he's Mr. Snidely. And they seem kind of like prudish. They're like looking down their nose at him because he's so coarse and vulgar, this uh, customer. So he picks out the perfect robot woman to live out his fantasy. And they send him off to this planet. So he lands there, and there's a total script, which he knows. And it, it goes, everything goes according to script. And they tell him, don't go off script, because the robot will be, get confused. He saves this beautiful woman from this monster. Of course, she's just like, I mean, it's such a insipid fantasy. She's just like, oh, my brave, dashing hero, you are superb. Let's make love. So she's just like the... The perfect woman if you were 12, <laughs> when you're a dumb kid, reading like pulp stuff or sexy sci-fi. This is what you hoped relationships would be like. And of course, it's completely unrealistic and dumb. So she just constantly wants to have sex. Of course, she's a great cook and she cooks them all this great food. And every now and then he has to rescue her from a monster. To add a little uh, pizzazz to the fantasy. He's got to return her within 24 hours. He's got to get her back to the Daydream Incorporated offices. But then uh, as he's taking her back, he realizes the keys are gone to the space cruiser. And then everything starts repeating himself. The script. Uh, she's saying the same exact shit she said 24 hours earlier. At the same time, she's like, oh, let's have sex. And he's really getting tired of it. In fact, it seems like he's uh, in pain. He's like, oh, not again. I can't have sex again. So then he gets to the point where he's just like, oh, my God, she won't let me leave. Uh, I'm going to die here. She's going to fuck me to death. And he's going to shoot her. Because, you know, she's a robot as far as he knows. But then she's like, no, wait, don't shoot. I'm real. It's Miss Peabody from the the company. 
And she basically said, oh, please don't tell my bosses I need this job. But for once, I wanted to have a crazy adventure, you know, fantasy adventure. Every day I have to hear about other people's fantasies. And then uh, the main dude takes off his mask, and it's Mr. Snidely. So the whole time they were actually two humans having sex. It wasn't a robot and a human like normal. And basically he says, oh, I've been doing this for a long time. I've, this is my fifth fantasy adventure. And she says, what do we do now, Mr. Snidely? And he says, I suggest we book a, an adventure of our own in a, a few months or so. <laughs> it's kind of silly. I don't know. Okay, this next one is the one kind of serious story. This is pretty, I actually was find it kind of moving. Very strange though, the choice of artists, because this is a post-apocalyptic type of story. And they get Ken Stacy. So you can tell, you know, Ken Stacy usually has beautiful, vibrant colors. It's very slick art, uh, almost um, like robotic. Always drawing great machines and robots. But I think in this one, he's trying to draw like raw. Because, I mean, this world is raw. So there's not pretty colors in a post-apocalyptic world. I mean, it's kind of gray and brown and whatever. So we see this little town. It's called One Day in Ohio. And it zooms in in this house. Obviously, a family lived there. And this robot, he's like the butler robot of this household. And all of a sudden, he clicks back into a life. And he's like, oh my, I haven't even dusted yet. He's totally doing his daily duties, but he's miswired. I mean, obviously he's damaged from the you know nuclear war and uh, he's got some wires crossed. He's throwing the laundry in the sink and he's throwing the dishes in the washing machine, the laundry machine. Um, he's like, time for school, Robert. Robert's the kid. And you know, Robert's, you know, dead. Obviously, we don't even see him. He grabs his doll and puts it in this little baby cart. And he takes him shopping. Of course, the supermarket's devastated. There's some rotting piece of cantaloupe. He's like, mmm, cantaloupe seem fresh. And then he just drops the doll, the E.T. looking doll. Doesn't care because he's really a messed up robot. And he's walking by a zoo. And I guess this monkey, chimpanzee, is still alive. Obviously starving. He's been stuck in the zoo since all of humanity has been obliterated. And the robot pulls him out of the jail and treats him like the baby and takes care of him. I guess he's got some semi-rotted food and feeds it to him and the monkey's sated. And he's just talking to him like the baby. He's like, that's enough shenanigans, Robert. And the monkey seems kind of happy, though. He's getting fed, and he's got, you know, this robot to keep him company. But then one day, the robot totally uh, fizzles out. His head explodes. So the monkey's all alone in this world. And he just clings to the chest of this robot, just doesn't know what to do. And this is pretty moving. The sending the camera pulls out, and this poor little monkey, this chimpanzee, is all alone in this post-apocalyptic world, staring at the camera, just like doesn't know what the hell's going on. But he's not happy. It does not seem good. Kind of like that one, even though the art's very lackluster for Stacy. I think it was a choice. I think he was trying to draw raw, almost ugly, because it's an ugly world. But. uh I don't know. This next story is called Deep Secrets. And it's got script by Bruce Jones, art, coloring, and lettering by Jeff Jones. Now, I actually looked up on the Grand Comic Database. I assumed this was a reprint from, you know, one of those 70s magazines from Skywald or one of their fanzine collaborations. Because Jeff Jones hadn't drawn a comic probably in 10 years. Um, a long time. Except for, like, Idol in National Lampoon and Heavy Metal. But as far as drawing like a sci-fi comic, it's been a long time. But it looks like he got him out of retirement to uh, do all the work on this. 
And this one's kind of weird. It's uh, called Deep Secrets. And we see this woman and she's floating in a void. It's basically completely black, even though he decides to color some things pretty with like these great purples and blues. And she hears this voice saying, Jenny, are you awake? The drug should be wearing off just about now. I only want the truth, Jenny. Just tell me the truth and I'll come get you. And she's like, damn you, Sid. Is this your idea of a joke? And the voice in her head, in her space helmet says, just tell me you didn't sleep with him, Jenny. That's all I want to know. Then I'll come get you. She's like, you're nuts, Sid. You're sick. And he's like, answer the question. And she thinks, you know, she's floating in space because she's got the space helmet on. She says, no stars. That means I'm on the dark side of Alpha Centauri. He says, you got at least an hour air, Jenny. Answer my question. And she basically just says, you want the truth? You're a lousy lover. Uh, not only did I fuck the guy you're thinking about, I fucked all your friends. You were terrible. I'm dis you disgust me. So she uh, basically uh, thinks she has the upper hand. She's like, you know that Alpha Centauri is one of the biggest shipping lanes in space. I'll be picked up in 10 minutes. So fuck you. Go out of my life. Just leave. And he says, you sure that's what you want? She says, I don't need you. He'll pick me up any second. And he says, I won't be back. She's like, good. Just leave me the hell alone. Can you dig it, Sid? <laughs> oh, I can dig it, Jenny. But I won't. <laughs> so she's actually in a grave. Because these drugs have just kind of disoriented her. She just feels like she's floating in the void. But she's actually buried alive. With this helmet that is running out of oxygen. So <laughs> kind of a silly gag at the end. But also kind of a, a kind of a good twist. And uh, man, it's nice seeing Jeff Jones. I still think this is a reprint. I can't believe Jeff Jones would draw something like this in 1983. Me, I mean, obviously it was colored now. So maybe Jeff Jones said, "Yeah, I'll color it for you." This old story. But I don't know. I couldn't find any information about it. Okay. Now, this story is very interesting. It's called Land of the Fre. And it's script by Bruce Jones, art by Al Williamson. This story was actually written and drawn in uh, the 50s for a Buster Crab comic. And in 1966, Wits End, Wally Wood's prosine, he apparently had um, seen the original pages of this because it was never published. Um, the company went out of business or something, and Al Williamson just went to the offices and says, just give me the original art. I know you guys got no money. You don't have to pay me, fuck it. But I, I, want, I like those pages. And another weird thing about this is that this is all co-written and, I'm sorry, co-drawn by the Flegel gang. Angela Torres, Frank Frazetta, and Rory Krenkel. They all helped out Al Williamson. Um, I'm not going to give you an exact breakdown, because this is actually uh, reprinted in a, another anthology, which one day I'll get to. But Whitsend, in 1966, published this with a new script. Because, you know, they couldn't have the Buster Crab references. And Wally Wood said, you know, I never liked that story anyway. I could write a better story. And he did. He added all the dialogue and the captions. And Wally Wood made it into another story. And... This is the weird thing. So now, I guess, almost 20 years later, Bruce Jones did the same thing. He rewrote the script again. And it's not just like changing a few words. He totally changes the plot. Just using the art. It's almost like Mystery Science Theater 3000, or not like that, or What's Up Tiger Lily, except it's, you know, trying to be serious. And I guess these aliens have invaded Earth. By the way, it's all laid out by Al Williamson, and then various panels are the Flegel gang. You you can probably pick out a lot of them. For example, here's Frank Frazetta. Very Frazetta E. And I guess these uh 
they're the last three humans on Earth, and for some reason the aliens have kept them alive. They have these underground caverns, these aliens, and they grab them and take them back down to the underground world. Look at that whole city. Totally Roy Crankle. You know, he was so good at that. And basically the aliens are saying, we're going to make you part of our human zoo. We, you know, we want to have a... You're part of Earth's history, and we want to preserve that. So they show all the exhibits they're working on. And pretty soon, you guys are going to live here and be a living exhibit. Some really nice art. I mean, is Al Williamson, what's all the Flegel gang at their prime? But of course, uh, Bruce Jones adds a little adult shit where they're like, ooh, we want to experiment with the female. Let's amuse ourselves. It is a first set of drawn women, so it's understandable. So the two dudes are getting uh, taken back to their cells. And the Buster Crab looking dude kind of uh, breaks free. He just won't give in. It's interesting, the whole time though, there's this, we, something's going on that we can't quite figure out where his companion, the Buster Crab's friend, and also the woman are like, what are you doing? You're being crazy. Cut it out. Even though he's like trying to rescue them from these aliens. We see that they're doing sensual experiments with the woman and one of the natives, the aliens, I should say. This is very silly, very odd story. But I mean, you can understand, he was kind of playing a little game. He had to take this art and totally change the story. So it's kind of clever when you consider that, that he had to fit all his word balloons and captions to this existing art that had already been two different stories. So he frees the woman and she's like, Phil, are you crazy? So it's like, wait, what's going on? Why are they chastising Phil for rescuing them? So he blasts the main engine room, like the reactor. And then they escape to the surface. And basically they blow up the whole underworld kingdom of the aliens. And then we realized this was all in his head. Phil was just, it's just crazy. I keep yelling at him to snap out of it, that he's living in a dream world, but I guess he's beyond help now. It's always that, it's always those that fight the hardest that lose the most. The end. Crazy Modern Colors by Joe Chiodo. A little garish. But uh, pretty nice art getting this uh, rare reprint. To be honest, this thing has been reprinted so many times. It's also in a Marvel uh, magazine sized comic called Unknown Worlds of Science Fiction. I don't know. I assume it has the Wally Wood script. That was like around 1975. So this story has such a crazy history. Because it's probably one of the few stories that Al Williamson owns the rights to. It was never printed in a comic, so all this beautiful original art was his to do with whatever he wanted. Most of Al Williamson's whole career, he was just drawing work for hire. He didn't own anything he ever printed. So there you have it, guys. I gotta say, a very silly issue of Alien Worlds. It's still kind of fun, because it's just so silly sometimes. It's pretty fun. But I'm sorry, I expect more from Bruce Jones. I'm a little disappointed in him. <laughs> A lot of silly twist endings in this. The first story is just kind of... <laughs> I mean, I like looking at the female form, but it's almost inexcusable. This silly cheesecake story. Some of these panels are just like, oh, man. But, you know, I bought this comic when I was 16, 15, and it was all right with me then. I liked it a lot. Um, I still like it. Who am I kidding? But 
it's also very dumb and silly. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. <laughs> I, I think I did. I did enjoy it. It's silly, but it is zany and like over the top silly where it's pretty, there's not many comics like this, uh, stories like this. So I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies.